This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Hello and welcome to Bewilderbeasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, recording from a dungeon in the basement. Today on Bewilderbeasts, we are going to be discussing flying sheep. Really? Okay, let's go. Hi, everyone. Week two from the new studio closet under the stairs. We do have some sad news to report from the homestead, though. Our beloved snail, Rocket, has passed away. He, or maybe she, seemed to be doing well after the move, but in the last couple of weeks, the shell started to look a little weird, and by the time I really got a chance to look, he, or she, was clearly no longer on this mortal coil. The funny thing about Rocket, though, was that he, or she, would suction to the bobbing thermometer and would ride it like it was Lady Gaga singing about a disco stick for hours. The kiddo and I would just make up pop songs to this little snail riding on his ride or die, the little aquarium thermometer. So if you get the chance today, pour one out for our homie Rocket the Snail, who was the first snail in our home with a sense of humor and the first land burial in our new home. So we have our little memorial area planned out. It was not one of the plans that I had made when we were trying to figure out what we need to do next in our home. Uh, But yeah, RIP Rocket. No one cleaned a tank or knew how to party like you did. And if you're around in the 90s, get low with a thousand percent be your jam. Today, we are going to talk about flying sheep, as I said at the top. But before we get to our furry French flying friend... Don't forget to check out the Patreon for bonus content. Support the show, blah, blah, blah. You hear this on every other show, so I'm not going to bore you. But I will say for those who are supporting at the $5 amount or higher, you're going to be getting a little special bonus in your mailboxes in the next few weeks, so keep an eye out for that little cheer. And this is open to everyone. AMA, ask me anything. If there's a silly question you have, send it in. I'm compiling questions from Twitter and email for a silly bonus thing for the holidays. So if you have a ridiculous question, I should have a ridiculous answer. (laughs) So ask it. And once I have enough questions, we're going to have a little fun. You can send that in to bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com or through Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or all those other avenues that you hear at the end of the show. So today's episode has a lot (laughs) of French. And... This will not be surprising once you hear me try to communicate some of these words back to you. I do not speak French. So I'm going to try my best, but please bear with me. Okay, so without further ado, is that a French word? Let's get on with the show. The sheep, the rooster, and the duck looked down. They looked way down. They were very confused. The people looked like ants and the clouds were getting closer. The duck was perhaps content because he wasn't flapping his wings, but the view was one that he was accustomed. This is much, much easier. The rooster (laughs) was perhaps flying his wings, but not necessarily to get back to the ground because this was just way too high. But most confused, certainly, was the sheep. Sheep are not supposed to fly. Our intrepid trio is going up, 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 Wizard of Oz style, in a flying balloon. The year is 1783. That's a while back. 
So hopping over in the Wayback Machine, let's see what else was going on aside from corseted tops and poofy skirts. While we say we became America in 1776, Great Britain did not acknowledge America's independence until February of 1783. And as this is right in the time frame of the hit show Hamilton, one founding father does actually make an appearance later on in this story, so stay tuned. And the weirdest sentence I've seen in quite some time, quote, the last celebration of Massacre Day is held in 1783. Celebration of Massacre Day. On its face, it doesn't look great. However, it turns out that the Massacre Day that they are celebrating is what was considered to be the first Americans who died for the American Revolution. Crispus Attucks being the first death. And in 1783, this last celebration, or I'm gonna call it a public vigil for Massacre Day, sounds way better in and out of context, was eventually replaced with Independence Day, July 4th, in honor of the Declaration of Independence. Here's an interesting note for those watching armed officers in cities right now. The final oration of the last Massacre Day was delivered by the Reverend Dr. Thomas Welsh. The focus was on the dangers of armed militia being stationed in American cities. Looking at you, Minneapolis. Evan Williams Bourbon was founded in Kentucky in 1783. Thanks, Evan. The continental U.S. was one-third the size it is today. America only went as far as Tennessee's western border. So we had Illinois, but probably not the White Sox or Blues Brothers yet, Wisconsin and all that sweet, sweet cheddar cheese, and the Mississippi Territory, which later became Alabama and Mississippi. But thanks to some clever French brothers, 1783 also gave us hot air balloons and one very, very confused baba. <laughs> So not only are we in 1783, but we are in 1783 France. So let's get in that old tiny steamship and cross the Atlantic, get off a boat, drop your jaw and say, ooh la la. Here we meet the Montgolfier brothers, the men known for making the first practical hot air balloon. And as you'll see, it's not really all that practical, but it was a start. We didn't know yet if the air up higher in the sky, the air higher than the tops of trees, we didn't know if it was even safe to breathe, if it was pure acid or if it was, well, pure acid of a different kind. We literally had no idea. They did suspect the air was lighter the higher they went, but they didn't know if people could survive up there unassisted. So before we get back to this story, let's go back and learn a little bit about these two old timey boys. Brothers Joseph Michel and Jacques Atienne Montgolfier were two of 16 children. 16 children. Whew. No wonder they wanted to get off Earth, find some peace and quiet somewhere that a sibling wouldn't be pestering them. In all seriousness, the Montgolfiers were in their 30s when they decided to embark on a project where they would design and create a flying balloon. There were many stories of how they were working in a paper factory, but maybe they saw how bits of paper burned and rose from the fire. Or maybe one saw their wife's dress puff up and it seemed to take flight when over flame. Either way, they decided to take this idea of heated air and see if they could build something that would allow for the hot air to power flight. The theory, I mean, it was very wrong, but it was a theory, but they did the best with the tools they had. But the theory was that the smoke itself contained a special gas, which, as all good inventors do, he named it after himself, Montgolfier Gas. And his theory was that Montgolfier gas had a property called levity. What the brothers did not realize was that warmer air is just lighter. Think about how heat rises. Hot air inside the balloon is warmer than the air outside the balloon, causing the hot air balloon to rise. So there is no Montgolfier gas unless he had just eaten several burritos pre-flight. The brothers tried to inflate paper bags with gas, thinking that this for sure would rise as if it were a sourdough starter in 2020. It did not. They then thought of using maybe a lighter gas, maybe something lighter than we breathe. Let's try hydrogen. Fortunately for them, this did not work out, but it didn't work out in a bad enough way to maybe prevent another situation down the road. This did not serve to be a cautionary tale decades later with the Hindenburg. Then the brothers thought, well, Let's just do what all good pyromaniacs do and just set things on fire. So they did that, and it seemed to work. Sort of. 
they used heated air to send a bag up into the sky, which got these two back on track. It's important to note here that while they are often credited for being the first in flight, as noted on the Stuff You Missed in History class, the Montgolfiers were just one team working on the initial race to the skies. And a lot of things had to happen to get them up in the sky first. Sound familiar? I mean, I could just as easily be talking about the space race to the moon or the more recent billionaires in space, space, space. But the first up is always a race. And these guys had a lot of very good things going in their favor to get them up there first. But they did not, and this is very important, these brothers did not invent the idea of sending something into the sky using fire. Y'all, there's evidence that Chinese lantern festivals have been going on for at least 1,801 years to about 2,226 years. So it's been a minute. Take all of that with a grain of salt wherever it's noted that maybe someone, especially Europeans, were the first at something. It's usually a great clue to dive a little deeper, confirm, confirm, confirm. Who knows? Maybe the brothers weren't watching someone's ballooning bodices over a blazing bonfire, but instead saw a picture of a traditional Chinese lantern festival and years later said in French, because they were French, Zut alors, I've got it. Then they tried a test. In 1782, they scaled up their prototype of the bag. Good scientists. They lit underneath with wool and hay, and evidently the lifting force on this was so great that the brothers lost control of their own prototype. It went over a mile, and the balloon was destroyed by bystanders who were probably rightfully freaked right out on pre-Twitter times with a flying balloon that was on fire and smelled of burning sheep. Anyway, in 1783, they took their idea on the road with the intention for others to see their sorcery in person. It was important to the Skyward siblings to get the attention of France's king and queen. They wanted to be seen, and most importantly, paid for by the crown as real scientists, good sciencey folk, inventors, innovators. They honestly just wanted to become government workers for the excellent old-timey benefits package and sweet, sweet cash. For their first feat, they got super lit. Seriously, they were humming an early version of Prodigy's Firestarter while setting wool and straw contained under the opening of the now full-sized model balloon on fire. But the balloon is no longer a little pocket thing that you could just pull out and hold in your hand. This balloon was now reconstructed, bigger, badder, burlapier. The now supersized hot air balloon weighed about 225 kilograms, which is about 500 pounds. It was constructed of four pieces of cloth held together by 1,800 buttons. Hey, Betsy Ross, eat your heart out. I can't even imagine how expensive a trip to Johan's fabric that would be. Uh, kids, I think it goes without saying that you should not try the next part of this at home. The balloon rose into the air about 3,000 feet. That's 1,000 meters. That's 50 bowling lanes high, as tall as the Three Sisters Falls in Peru, which is the third highest waterfall in the world, and half as long as the Kentucky Derby racetrack. That said, this experiment lasted way longer than the Kentucky Derby, famously called the fastest two minutes in sports. The balloon stayed airborne for about 10 minutes, then settled down to the ground more than a mile and a half from where it rose. The Montgolfiers then traveled to Paris with their featured act, and then on to Versailles. It was time to show the king. You might have actually heard about this guy, King Louis XVI and a lady friend of his, Queen Marie Antoinette. They didn't know this at the time, but they would be the last king and queen of France because of a teeny tiny little revolution just a few years later. I bet they wish they had a hot air balloon to escape then. The brothers arrived with their big balloon, but it had to go through some major remodels just before their big act in front of royalty. The balloon had to undoubtedly be considered the balloon of the ball, right? Show off the best possible side. The balloon, when performing for King Louis and Marie Antoinette, was essentially in Balloon Sunday's Best. The envelope, which I think is the balloon part of the balloon, 
was sky blue and gold silk and paper coated with a varnish of alum for fireproofing, which when playing with fire and flammable paper, sheep wool and silk, good call. It, can, it also had lots of the king's symbology on it. So if you Google the Montgolfier's balloon, you will see it. It is a stunning balloon, especially more if you know that they did this without electricity to power a sewing machine, which also didn't yet exist. King Louis, oh, this kidder, he thought the Montgolfier should put on a big show, put someone in the balloon and send it up as a trial, one up their previous experiments in front of the king, do something that has never been done before. No pressure. So since we didn't have NASA yet, there was no way to know how the higher altitude would affect people. And since this balloon's main purpose was for travel, King Louis wanted a person in the basket. Which, if you really want to know, wasn't a basket in the way that we think of a basket in a hot air balloon today. Picture a light bulb. That's the basic shape of a hot air balloon. But instead of a basket, imagine that light bulb is screwed into a donut. That donut, that ring around the outside of the bottom, is where the people would sit. It was divoted down so people could stand around the ring and look over the edge, theoretically safely, but that's the basic shape of the balloon that the Montgolfiers had designed. King Louis wanted a man in the basket, so he volunteered prisoners. Heek, don't love that. But the Montgolfiers had a backup plan, a more humane plan, at least from the prisoner's perspective. Let's instead put these French flocking animals up in the sky. So three animals volunteered. Sorry, were volunteered. The first animal was a duck. Ducks fly anyway, right? So he was effectively the control for this whole experiment. The second was a rooster. They don't fly well, so he was a bird who might be able to breathe and maybe not that far up. We didn't know. It made sense at the time. And the third animal? A sheep named Montaussier, which means climb to the sky in French. I feel like this sheep was probably named just before the flight for a PR stunt. Either that, or these two brothers happened to be going around the entire French countryside looking for just the right named sheep to take with them, who was already named something cool. Hey, we've seen a lot of Baba Streisands, a ton of buttercups, a few lamb chops, which, unsettling, but some of us have a macabre sense of humor, so sure. Ooh, Rammstein. I don't get it, but I hear this plays well in the 1990s. So why the sheep? Well, I personally say why not the sheep, because these puns write themselves. You are the wind beneath my wings. What are the ramifications if I fall out? I bet it would be really bad. The rationale was that the sheep was a mammal incapable of flight. It's physiology and that it breathed air like humans do, down here on the ground like we humans do, and is not gifted with wings like we humans are also not gifted with wings. The sheep would be analogous or close enough to a person to test. The hope was obviously all three animals would survive the flight and more importantly, survive the likely crash to the ground because as the old adage goes, it's not the fall that will kill you. It's the sudden stop at the end. So that's how a duck, a rooster, and a sheep were volunteered instead of prisoners and were put in the balloon. Weirdly, the duck didn't fly away. The rooster could brag that he was legitimately higher than any rooster went before him, and the sheep could just stand there and go, La ba? Or, what the flock? Or something. We really don't know what they were thinking. No one wanted the animals to go splat. No one wanted the animals to die due to lack of oxygen, but if anyone did die due to lack of breathable air, the chances the sheep would kick it was theorized at the time to be quite high. And if the sheep came back, but the spirit was in the afterlife, the Montgolfier brothers were likely going to have to put in a lot more work to make their invention functional for travel, not just look super cool. Because in 1783, this wasn't rocket science because we didn't have rocket science yet. That came later. Balloon science made rockets possible. 
So seeing a giant freaking balloon you can ride in before the invention of the airplane or modern rockets is really neat. But it would be even cooler if people could just ride in the basket and take a memorable ride high above the tree line. The hope was that the animals would survive so that people could touch the clouds. But the possibility existed that extra work would have to go into making this practical if there was a fatality. Proposals to your beloved look way better in the sky under a colorful balloon without a plague doctor looking mask rigged for oxygen, somehow. They would figure it out later for sure, but they first needed to see if the sheep would live. The fire was lit. The heat from the flame warmed the air with the confused barnyard trio quacking, crowing, and just standing there sheepishly, probably. The audience, the royals, the prisoners not in the basket all waited with anticipation for the signal. Then, the cannon fired. The balloon rose from the ground about 500 meters into the sky. That's about one and a third times the height of the Empire State Building, which, I don't have to remind you, was not built yet. But when it was built, the spire, the big pointy bit at the top, was supposed to be used to tie down blimps so people could disembark from the blimp at the 102nd floor. But we didn't have blimps yet either. Those came later. First, we had to see if the sheep would live. The audience en masse jogged, walked, and, well, likely fanned themselves, as that's how I pictured old-timey times, to keep up with the balloon as it drifted away without control for eight minutes and landed in a forest. It's said that people were very concerned about the animals, and while that may be true, what is also undeniably true is if the sheep lived, they might be the next to go up into the sky on this adventure, the adventure high above the ground in the magic flying balloon. The crowd arrived to see both the rooster and the duck stunned but alive near the knocked-over basket. But what about the sheep? Unsurprising to no one now, Montosier, the sheep after my own heart, was contentedly eating. There was much rejoicing. The balloon worked. No one died. No further equipment was needed for humans to survive in the balloon. Huzzah! Let's get right down to business. We know what we know because of Benjamin Franklin, Mr. Electric Kite himself. Remember, I told you a founding father would make an appearance. He gave many gifts. Electricity, syphilis, and drawn images of the crowd and the balloon in flight that specific day as he happened to be in attendance. Unfortunately, the duck and the rooster did not get names, did not get the attention they deserved for their contribution to science. I couldn't find lick about our feathered friends. But Montalcier, the sheep, was adopted by Marie Antoinette, retired from a full career in aviation sciences, Instead, it is said that Montosier spent long days eating candy and marshmallows in the queen's sheepfold. It is unclear if the sheep lived long enough for the angry mob to storm the prison six years later in 1789, releasing seven prisoners. Maybe some of these prisoners were nearly volunteered before we knew balloon flight was safe for people who were involved in this revolt. The storming of Bastille. The event that is celebrated now called Bastille Day by English speakers, the National Day of France, the events and the day that started the French Revolution, the day that started making King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette's lives a little bit more difficult as they were executed a short time later. They were the last king and queen of France. I bet they preferred the basket in the sky instead of the one their heads ended up in after the guillotines came. It's unclear if the sheep lived through any of this, but I'd like to think Montosier just calmly ate grass as the troops came in a few years after the flight. The flight that wasn't rocket science yet, but made rocket science possible. The same science that allowed for billionaires to go into space for a day trip and even take Captain Kirk himself a few weeks later. And for us to hop a red eye to the other side of the planet or an Aer Lingus flight to have a honeymoon. But I want to remember these people, these animals in this moment, in a moment of awe before we knew anything else. 
the people small as ants staring up at a shrinking balloon careening towards the clouds. Not yet sure if this would work. The animals looking down in confusion. The rooster uselessly flapping because, well, <coughs> rooster. And the duck thinking, well, this is much easier. Why waste the effort? And the sheep <coughs> maybe thinking, the grass is always greener. Hey, let's go over there to that forest for a quick snack. So thanks for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If you want more of this history, science, weirdness, seriousness, all of it, check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash bewilderbeasts. There are great episodes over there. There's one featuring Pablo Escobar's cocaine hippos. It's not at all what you think, but it is the world's largest invasive species. <laughs> Bonus episodes for everyone at a dollar a month and extra goodies for those of you who support at a higher level. I love doing the show, and you do get extra stuff if you support too. Perhaps the best benefit of Patreon is that I don't ask you to support on Patreon over there, so there's that. If there are topics you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who change the world, current events with animals in the news, animals who help humans, anything like that, send them in to bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at bewilderedpod, bewilderbeastpod on Facebook, and at bewilderbeast on Instagram. I love to hear from you, so send a note, leave a review. It truly helps, and I read them all. Try Podchaser or iTunes, they really help. And that's it. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath with Mutt Stuff Media. Now go get curious. I got today's information from storytellershat.com, time.com, atlasobscura.com, fashionhistory.fitnyc.edu, britannica.com, MIT.edu, Stuff You Missed in History Class, and the book Science Comics Rockets, Defying Gravity by Anne and Jersey Drozd. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Additional music provided by Pixabay and freesound.org. Don't forget to like, subscribe, review, and share. Please share with your curious friends. Thanks so much for listening. I'll see you next week.